go like, wow, what a cool, cool place it is uh, behind me, right there. <laughs> the Broadway used to be the main center of the Jewish community here in Krakow, kind of a trading place, main market square of the Kazimierz city, we would say. And it used to be uh, used by traders, merchants, up until, uh, well, the times of about 20 years ago when this parking lot was created here, which is not exactly a good thing. I hope in the future it's going to be finally removed. Oh. During German occupation, um, it was yeah. destroyed. Maybe we move just a bit, maybe. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, Broadway, why do I call it Broadway? Well, because it's naming Polish, uh, and Polish was the regular language here, not only for the Polish people, but also many of the Jews here, uh, was, it, it, and still is, Ulica Czeroka. It would translate in, uh, into English almost literally as Broadway, we would say, more or less. And uh, so like a wide street or something like this. Still, it is very easy to remember it then, right? So this is the Broadway. It's lined with many restaurants right now over, over here. Some of them uh, sell uh, also Jewish food, uh, some of, uh, so basically you may try uh, something uh, that is, um, um, well, you may try this Jewish culture here uh, almost personally, I would say. You may also find some Jewish culture, uh, Jewish music concerts being played here and so. And now, what about the big revival of interest in Jewish culture here in Poland? 40 years of communism, total neglect, this culture was completely forgotten. That is what the Communist Party wanted, actually. And then, we've got the revival. People start to appreciate what was here before Second World War, multinationality. Many young Polish people start to learn Jewish language, for example, yeah, Hebrew, most of them. They uh, learn how to dance Jewish dances. Uh, they participate in uh, Jewish culture festivals here. The, one of them, Jewish culture, the main Jewish culture festival, happening every June, in the end of June, here in, po in Poland, is one of the biggest uh, Jewish culture festivals in the world. And uh, just imagine, all this area, with all those small streets here and there, is filled with people playing music, for example, outdoors. Many uh, Jewish artists from all around the world come here to show their culture to the locals, to the Gentiles, who want to know, once again, they get to know what was it like before Second World War. And then, uh, the final concert is happening here on this, actually, Broadway. The parking lot is being removed, and 20,000 people fill in this place. They jump to the rhythm of Jewish music, because there's a big concert always here, and uh, uh, it is not only your traditional klezmer Jewish music, but also um, techno and metal and disco and so, it's much more contemporary than you would think. And uh, uh, just imagine that most of those 20,000 people who gather here are not you know, Jewish people, but usually just Gentiles who want to, once again, learn how it was before Second World War. They want to learn about this, their long-gone neighbors, we would say. It is really changing right now. There is a very, very good climate here uh, for the Jewish culture here in Poland, and I hope it stays like that, uh, well, forever. And now, the, ma the name for this final concert that is, that is happening here uh, is actually also the name, the, the word that, uh, um, that stands for peace in Hebrew. What is this word? Maybe you know. Probably the most known of Jewish of Hebrew. Shalom. Exactly, Shalom. Shalom is this name of this final concert here. And uh, well, what is Shalom means also, also peace. But Shalom can also stand for hello and goodbye in Hebrew. Uh, it's a little bit more, maybe formal way, but that's what it is. Could you just Repeat Shalom like this, shalom. 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 Thank you. So Shalom to you and hello and welcome to this tour just like this. After this kind of a long introduction right now we're going to move a little bit more and uh, I'm going to teach you probably two more words here on the way so just keep them, uh, keep them in mind and I'm going to test you in the end so that you may remember something from this tour. And right now let's go to the other side of Broadway and let's see uh, what connects the ancient Jewish culture and science fiction of nowadays. You may be interested in that. Follow me. Ja. 
Jewish culture was evolving here in Poland for centuries uh, and uh, of course it also had its own uh, well institutions administration uh, cemeteries and so basically it was like a kind of a country within the country would you say and uh, then uh, this place actually that is just in front of us here uh, is a place which is known as probably maybe the first Jewish cemetery here in po here in Krakow there are no tombstones that you can find here as you see but some people actually say that if such a place was left alone so to say if it was not used for trade it must have been something sacred actually so probably even a cemetery and there's a legend telling you why we call this place a cemetery uh, well in uh, probably 15th century uh, there was a big event here a wedding uh, of uh, one uh, of the local uh, local Jews here and uh, they were having this wedding uh, and uh, uh, they were having a party, quite a long one, let's say it took them for a, a few days and uh, in the end they didn't uh, see the, the, the most important Jewish, uh, Jewish festival coming, which is happening every week like this. What is the name of that festival, this holiday, let's say? It's the most important one, for, uh, the most important uh, uh, Jewish festival. Just, you know, happening regularly every week, remember. <coughs> Shabbat, 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 exactly. Shabbat or Sabbath, whatever you actually pronounce it, is the is the one. And then uh, th there was a party here at this place exactly, uh, and those uh, well the, the uh, new Eds were actually also having a party, and there were many guests here, and they were just follow they were just continuing this party, and then they didn't see the Sabbath coming, and uh, it started at dawn uh, at Friday, and uh, God got angry actually and he killed all those you know who had this party here just uh, at this spot uh, with with the lightning as they say actually so <coughs> I don't believe in that because God is good but uh, anyway uh, this is the legend that tells you how come that this place used to, used to be called uh, uh, is sometimes called the oldest uh, well Jewish cemetery in Krakow we're gonna see the second oldest Jewish cemetery in Krakow which still stands here in a in a while but now let's just watch this small monument here, the monument of 65, uh, to, uh, that is to commemorate 65,000 Jewish Krakowians from before the war. And it tells us how a Jewish tombstone might look like. It is like a stone here, you got those small stones put, to, uh, put here also on this um, monument to commemorate those who died. And sometimes the Jewish tombstones of old have special markings. And those markings may indicate what such person who died was doing during his or her, or her lifetime. And now, Try imagining, you see seeing this stone and it's got the marking of a snake. What was this person, what would be this person doing uh, then, actually? Doctor? Exactly. This person would be a doctor. That would be, you know, that's the like indi indication of a job. That's it. Exactly. Congratulations. And then, the second marking, uh, for example, um, let's take a book. What would book mean on, on a tombstone of, of a person? Teacher, exactly. Teacher, a scholar, somebody very wise for sure. Uh, and then, well, you can have a marking of um, oh, like this. Are you familiar with this? Maybe some of you. Live long and prosper. Exactly. This is the so-called Spock gesture. Have you heard about Star Trek series once? Maybe. Star Trek is a classic series of science fiction that was started in the United States in 1960s. It continues up until this day being overly popular uh, amongst uh, those uh, science fiction freaks, but not only, I would say. If you haven't watched it, try it. Certainly you've heard the name Star Trek, I believe. Uh, and then, this gesture is shown there many, many times. Uh, what does it mean? Well, in Star Trek, it is actually a sign of peace. When you're showing this to someone, you should say, as I said, live long and prosper. And then, it is also a sign of peace in Jewish culture. It is a sign gesture of, uh, of blessing that was used by the high priests of Jerusalem who were actually serving in the original two temples of Jerusalem. Then it, was also it is also used up until now by the rabbis to bless people. So this is basically the same, this, this got basically the same meaning, shalom, peace to you. And then uh, you see, uh, 
you can see the sign on many of the tombstones in the in uh, in some old Jewish cemeteries and marking the people who are from the house of Levi who are designed to be rabbis for example just like this you can see them also here on this Jewish cemetery that we're going to see in a, in a while uh, here in the Jewish quarter and uh, how these two actually connect them right uh, how this does Star Trek connect to this ancient uh, history well basically our original cast of Star Trek in late 1960s well there were Americans but many of them were did have Jewish roots as well so they felt it would be so cool to introduce this sign once again to popular culture uh, so this ancient sign of a peace and if you know it you usually know it just because of Star Trek and not because it is connected to Jewish culture right so now uh, I've got a task for you can you do this sign this gesture with your both hands and you just perform it okay okay good 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 good, good, good. Nice. okay so I'll tell you something now well urban legend or not but it is said if you can perform this gesture with your both hands with left and right you are actually descendant of the high priest of Jerusalem as well uh, true or not but congratulations anyway I remember I wasn't able to do it actually uh, for a very long time uh, but I was envious about you here you tourists here so I started practicing it and right now it hurts a lot but I can after two <laughs> but if you cannot do it, you may in fact also practice. Well, just a, uh, just a, just a thing. And now we have to turn ourselves. I got and I've got a small, let's say, surprise for probably most, probably rather for the ladies. Let me just walk here. Okay. So now there's a car coming. Let uh, let it just pass, maybe. Or does it stop? Oh yeah. yeah. Let it pass, let it pass. <laughs> okay, so a question to you. Is there anybody from you familiar with the name uh, Helen Rubinstein, maybe? Or HR as it is an acronym. Yeah, Helen Rubinstein. What is that? Makeup. Yeah, I see some of you are from uh -huh. Mes makeup, Cosme cosmetics brand actually, which is one of the most luxurious and one of the most renowned in the world right now, although it is completely it's very very expensive as far as I've checked the last time and well you see Helen Rubinstein uh, is of course also the name of the founder of the company and Helen Rubinstein herself was born in this green house just on the left here uh, from here and what was important what was so important about that woman well she was born here in Poland to a Jewish family then she migrated to Australia and then in Australia she was the only woman who had actually very beautiful skin and then the, the other Australian women were, were actually very very uh, in Mm, very eager to know what is her secret, what is the secret of Helen Rubinstein so that she is so beautiful. Her secret was uh, was that that he, she has taken a small bottle of cream with, with her that was that was bring, uh, that was brought to her by her mother actually and then she used it there in Australia and uh, as she saw that she's got this she's got this cream and the other women in Australia do, do not have that oh. yes. Okay, and uh, she saw that she's got the secret cream and the others do not have that. Well, she decided to make a business out of it. She basically started to produce this cream down there in Australia. She uh, established her own brand, Helen Rubinstein. Then she migrated to the United States to make it even bigger. And she was one of the first women who were millionaires without, let's say, the help of marrying a rich guy, which is quite an exception 100 years ago. You have to remember, it wasn't like this today, right? It wasn't, so let's say, uh, well, she was like one of the pioneers to, uh, that fight, fought for the, uh, for the uh, rights of women, we would say even. And uh, well, she was also responsible for introducing term makeup to uh, the, her advertisements and as her brand was spe spectacularly popular in 1920s, 1930s, we may say, uh, we, with, uh, we may thank for this term makeup being present right now all around the world thanks to that woman as well. And now, even if you don't know the name Helen Rubinstein, you're certainly familiar with the name, ouch, with the name, Ma yeah, sorry, uh, it's a busy place. Uh, Okay, Just give me a second, sorry for that. Okay, uh, certainly you're familiar with the name of, uh, of a brand called Max Factor, maybe, yeah? I think most of you have heard about it. So Max Factor was also a, a com company uh, that was established by a Polish Jew uh, in 
uh, in late 19th century there was a man who was living in the city of Łódź, which is located just in between Warsaw and Krakow. And uh, from uh, from uh, and that guy who was born there, who set up this company, Max Factor, was actually named Maximilian Faktorowicz. So he shortened his name up a little bit for marketing reasons. And then also he migrated to the United, to the United States. And right now we know his name just because he made it really, really big as well. And the last maybe example, although we could go on with the list like that forever. Uh, have you heard about the? Have you watched maybe any movies from Warner Bros? Yes. Warner Bros. were the Warner Brothers as well. Well, these were really brothers, four Jewish brothers from Northern Poland who migrated from there in the late 19th century to the United States. They had their name, which was Von Zau. They, cha they changed it into Warner to, to just make it sound more American, so to say. And they also had a great success. And you th you, 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 I'm pretty sure that 100% of you has seen at least one movie or cartoon from Warner Bros. So really, really great success. And now, we're going to move away from here, from this space, and I'm going to show you how a regular street before Second World War might have looked like here. And it was this, once again, an example of multiculturality of Poland before, uh, before these hard times of Second World War. So uh, prepare your maybe cameras because it's pretty much a picturesque spot. Let's go a few meters away.